come from in your mind? What type of background do you have that you can be so descriptive and uh, describe the scenes, describe the playing, describe uh, all of these things that you just didn't uh, make this up? Yeah, well, it takes place in the uh, southwest corner of Pennsylvania in a little fictitious mountain town. And uh, I'm relatively familiar with, you know, southwestern Pennsylvania <laughs> and uh, in the mountains of Pennsylvania. So um, there's that and the way people talk down there. Uh, I'm also personally uh, interested in, in the horror genre and everything. Love it in horror movies. And, yeah. and I had initially begun to write a noir series that uh, incorporated sort of the supernatural element to it. And I, I didn't have the means to finish it before, so I began to write this. And it just so happens that this book started to come out supernaturally and uh, managed to fit it into the universe. One of the things that we try to impress upon people in this show is the importance and the benefits of being able to label and describe not only your thoughts and feelings, but your surroundings, uh, where you're at. We use a reset button type of technique that we are, we appear in the present moment. We ask people to do a reset. We ask them to close their eyes very tightly for 30 seconds and then open them and imagine it's the first time that you had sight and describe everything that you see or to hold your breath for as long as you can and then take that first breath and then imagine that's the first breath that you've ever taken. We ask people to label and describe as accurately as they can where they're at and what they're doing and that's a purpose to be in the moment. And I found that particularly these quote, monsters that were in this story, you gave a very, very, very uh, detailed description of them, and I could almost see them. I could almost feel the drool coming off of their fangs. Uh, so how, where did that come from? How did... Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a real tricky part of writing is you want to paint the picture, but you don't want to be pedantic and you don't want to over-describe. You, uh, you don't want to say, you know, he he like got on the bus or something like that and describe every last little feature of the bus. Cause we've all been on buses. We all know what buses are like, you know, just describe the, the senses that are hitting the guy, you know, the, like maybe the smell of the seat or something like that, or the BO, the general BO of the bus or whatever. Right. But as well, although everybody's been on buses, nobody, I don't think has faced any of these. Uh, but nobody's faced a monster. Yes. Right. <laughs> so. Right. And, uh, you know, I ter the, the term monsters are kind of relative, too, because where they came from, uh, in their world, they wouldn't be monsters, would they? I mean, it depends uh, how you look at it, because they, they're kind of monsters because they're from hell, and supposedly that's where people go to be and the tormented only, by monsters. And the only reason that they are monsters, because the only reason we compare them, call them monsters, as compared to the other folks, the other humans in that town. Right. But if the world were populated by uh, them, they wouldn't be termed monsters. They would just be denizens. And they would just be the things, yes. They, they would just they would be, be terrifying they would things. Be the, they, would be <laughs> the, they would be the inhabitants. Well, perhaps they weren't terrifying to each other. To each other, yeah. So they were, they were terrifying to the humans. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, then that's, that, that leads me to a, another part of your character development where you have these twists and turns. And actually, although I've uh, read a number of these things, and as a behavioral health therapist, I'm trained to expect the unexpected, you, uh, you twisted me around a few times. All right. So tell us about uh, these particular plot, plot twists. We don't want to ruin everything for, ever, for anybody because I certainly... Uh, recommend this book very highly. And one of the things we always talk about on this show is that we tell the truth. And if I thought that this book were a bag of rusty nails, I'd gently tell you so. All right. Uh, however, it is not. Well, thank you. And it, it kept it kept my mind intrigued uh, as you kept uh, taking me down uh, corridors, uh, some blind ones, and then, then a side door would open up and suck me in there. Uh, so tell me about this mind of yours that, that can deal with these things. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I'm just... Uh... You know, kind of going on what is popular in current media right now, particularly like Game of Thrones and um, and, and all the other things that are just blowing up, like Black Mirror and uh, name name some other ones that people are just absolutely nuts about. What do they all have? They've, they've all got these incredible plot twists, deep characters, long, twisty backstories, you know, that lead to, that end up leading to surprises. So like... 
despite what you know the 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 networks who are just churning out the same old media with different faces and different titles and different jokes uh would have you believe uh american audiences can handle a challenge like game of thrones the, wed the red redding scene you know like people lost their minds over that and and that was one of the huge hooks in the walking dead like all the all the you know people go crazy for the the unexpected deaths and that and um all these surprises and and twists and turns american audiences can handle a challenge and and I don't think the mainstream uh, entertainment in this country is capitalized on that. You know, everybody want, everybody assumes we all want the happy ending where the hero gets away and uh, rides off into the sunset and, mm -hmm. and the entire town is saved and, and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I, 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 one of my goals is to challenge the audience as well and well, surprise yeah. them. Challenging, challenging them and surprising them. So what we always talk about is expecting the unexpected and impacting your life and walking walking through your life and participating in it laughing out loud and generally books reach a crescendo and then they wrap and then they and then they wrap things up okay so but in yours your the last 30 or 40 50 pages was like a, a maelstrom of uh of action and activity and when i'd reach a crescendo you'd you'd take me somewhere else and hit another one now that that was amazing Thank you. What was it like to write that at the end? That was kind well, of a rush. It was kind of a rush reading it. Yeah. Um, I tend to find out, like, a as I'm writing, uh, um, you know, some something bad happens and, oh, crap, well, this character has magical powers and they can just go there and, and mess somebody up. So, uh, well, I guess everybody has to make quick decisions now. So, <laughs> like, I end up, you, th you think your book is going to take the span of weeks and then it ends up only taking the span of a few nights because, oh, crap, that witch could just at any time, you know, create a plot hole by the fact that she's magical. And if she finds out that this guy's coming for her, she can just go and off him while he's sleeping. So I guess that guy's not going to get to sleep. <laughs> I guess we're going to have to wrap this up, you know. So and then he's got to go this place and then he's got to go to that place and get this person on board and all that thing. So in your creative process, I've often uh talk to some writers or read about them and they have the ending in mind before they even start the beginning of the book. Was that the same way with you? That is, Josh? that is a very good idea. Um, no, actually this book grew out of a short story that I wrote, uh -huh. um, for, for, uh, my girlfriend, Alyssa Heron, who also read a novel. It's called drowning above water. Check it out. Uh, she, uh, she had told me that, uh, well, I, I don't want to get into a huge long backstory, but it it had, it had grown out of a short story that I wrote. That it was it was kind of like a Twilight Zoney type story about a, a woman who uh, takes her her dead father's uh, um, old hot rod out for a joyride, um, just to you know have a have a remembering thing for herself of him, and she ends up going over a hill and seeing an identical hot rod and indeed an identical her in said hot rod coming up over the hill and they crash into each other and then the cops investigate and they find out that uh you know the part of the world that she lived in had been duplicated but only a few square miles and reversed and so i was like trying to explain how that would work in my head and and as i figured out more and more things and put more pieces together uh you know this book kind of grew out of that that doesn't really happen in this book that particular short story what are your influences? What got you into writing this type of uh, literature? What are what are the type of movies you like to see? What are some of the authors that you follow? Yeah, um, uh, uh, let's see. Authors: Neil Gaiman, big fan. Clive Barker, big fan. Uh, a little bit of Stephen King. Movies: Army of Darkness, my mm. favorite movie of all time. Army Bruce Campbell, yeah. Sam Raimi, all that uh -huh. stuff. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, generally the horror genre. Mm -hmm. I like decent horror. I like I like uh, psychological thrillers more than anything. Don't really care for the gore. Like Freddy Krueger's a cartoon, and mm -hmm. and Mike Myers doesn't do anything for me, and uh, uh, or 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 Jason, Jason a little bit, but uh, yeah, I like I like the Descent. Did you ever see the Descent? Mm -hmm. The girl, the women in the cave, go spelunking. That movie terrified me. Uh. That, that was wonderful. That was and it and it had everything I like too, where you have like the hero has their uh, sort of their baptism in blood, and then they 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 come out and they're a badass, and they start uh, they start wrecking stuff and and fighting against the monsters, and they kind of get away, but not really. 
So what, don't we, what we try to do is, in our program is help people develop an inner voice because quite often most people that we deal with have uh, a deep inner critic inside that are constantly giving bad reviews of their life. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, or if they do get some motivation, it's like running a seven, running a hundred yard dash and then stopping after 75 yards, uh, procrastination, uh, boredom, weariness and writing this novel. So tell us about dealing with those type of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you're your own worst critic. Isn't just, uh, you know, a, a cliche in Egypt. Uh, so, <laughs> Um, yeah, and it was about the 75% mark that I was through this book where I had all these loose ends and a, a fair way to go to wrap them all up. And I just sat there and I looked at the book and I was like, this is terrible. This is going to be awful. I'm never going to finish it. I'm never going to get everything wrapped up. I've got too many loose ends going here and this way and that, and I'm probably going to miss one and everybody's going to think it sucks. So I should just probably stop writing now. So what did you what to, so what did you say to that voice? What did I say to that voice? Um, uh, I don't know that I necessarily said anything to it so much as it was just a sense of duty to finish it. Um, it was like I'd, I'd I'd gone this far and I had the time and the means and to to do it. So what we help people do, we help people understand, hopefully understand in this show, that our brains are nothing more than a massive organic goo. Yes. And they're repositories for data. So then we have our mind, and our mind is the processor that shapes, shifts, sorts, uh, gives importance to urgency, to thoughts. And simply because we have a thought doesn't make it true. Okay, and sometimes just because of the yes. loudness, the repetitiveness of a thought that our mind thinks that it's 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 important, and we quit it like we'll never get this done. I, it's I'm so tired. I'll, this is getting boring. I don't know which way to go. I'm lost. Uh, but that that is our mind, and our mind can become like an unruly child at times. Okay. Yes. So when we get into that mode, what we help people do, Josh, is step outside, and we help people connect with their authentic selves and look at situations rather than from them. To look at that mind and rather yell at it to encourage and support it. Yes. I'll tell you, uh, or if I got like stuck in a rut while I was writing where I just couldn't get any words to come out. Um, and, and just general advice I give to any of my friends who are feeling down or like they're stuck in a rut or whatever. Sometimes the only thing you can do is put your head down and grind or push the damn car out of the mud, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> You know, if you if, if you only push the car a foot, you've at least gone a foot. You know? So one of the hard one of the things that we encounter with people, one of the hardest things for people to do is to just to start to start anything. So I imagine there was a break when you hadn't written for a while. And how did? How oh yeah, did, the holidays. How, so actually, how did you actually sit down and start again? How did I start again after yes. the break and mm -hmm. after I got stuck there? Yeah, that wasn't fun. Yeah, it was hard. I had to pretty, I pretty much, uh, I think I was probably 60% of the way through writing the book whenever I, uh, I, I, I had that holiday hiatus essentially from like October to after Christmas, like you can't get anything done. I don't care who you are. Uh, <laughs> but, um, how did I get out of it? It was, it was simply a case of sitting down and forcing myself to like leave the phone over in the kitchen or something like that and forget that I even had a phone <laughs> so that I couldn't procrastinate anymore and just look at the damn story and uh, read over everything I had to reread over, which was most of the story. Um, luckily, it was well organized. Uh, so I would say that's a, that's a good key is being well organized in the first place so that you have all your ducks where you know they're going to be when so you come back to it. What I'm hearing you say is, first of all, you disconnected from distractions. Yes. Okay. That's that's real important. That's what we try to help the people do because the chatter of life and the chatter of the chatter in our head, uh, it's we liken it sometimes to tuning into a, a radio station and then there's still a whole lot of static around. Mm -hmm. So the less distractions we have, the stronger the signal, the more focused we are. And then, and what I'm saying, what I'm hearing you telling is, I said to myself, so this dysregulated, bored thinker of yours that uh, wanted to get stuck in the holidays, were you said to yourself, hey, you know, let's disconnect, 
Here's what we, we've already accomplished this much. Here's what we can do because sometimes our mind, Josh, says it keeps telling us what we can't do rather than what we can. Indeed. That's, uh, yes. So tell our us. Our brains what, don't like change. They like the status quo. They like, they like consonants. They like, yeah. they like the, the water. To I know water. I'm here and I'm alive and this is working. So. You know what you can do. Yeah. You know what your gifts, talents, and abilities are. Please check out our website at fishingwithoutbait.com, where you can listen to the show, comment on our discussions, and find out where you can subscribe to our podcast. If you're interested in flying the colors of Fishing Without Bait, click the shop icon on our website. We have clothing, mugs, cell phone cases, and so much more. Show the world that you fish without bait. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.